So welcome to class number three. Before we continue and move on, we're going to answer some questions that came in over the past 23 and a half hours. Um, first thing is that in yesterday's class, when we were talking about somebody who places his trust in himself, Bena Bechayo was saying, people may place their trust in things other than Hashem. And one of those things that a person places a trust in, erroneously, inc incorrectly, is he could place his trust in himself. And um, so I mentioned, because, you know, one of the teachings of the Baal Shem Tov is that von alts darf man lernen, von alts darf man erreis nemen a heiro in a vedas Hashem. That everything that you von alts was mezet und was mehert, darf man erreis nemen a heiro in a vedas Hashem. So whatever you hear, whatever you see, whatever bashkocha pratis uh, we know about in the world right now, it, it has to apply to us. We only know it because it's to teach us something. So when I mention the idea of placing our our trust in ourselves, which is a misplaced, um, or it's mis a misplaced trust, our trust should only be in Hashem. So I mentioned yesterday the governor said, God didn't do this, we did this. Okay, so um, based on a question or two that I got, I just wanted to clarify. So people were saying that maybe I was making a political statement about the policies. First of all, if you want to know, first of all, one has nothing to do with the other. One has nothing to do with the other, uh, whether or not whatever uh, I had said or not said about shelter in place or about quarantine or any of those things. That's first of all. Why? Because as a rabbi, I have a duty to speak on one thing, on belief and faith and morality. And when a leader, when a person in responsibility utters the words, God did not do this, no matter what his intention was, no matter what his frustrations were, even if religious people or people, so-called religious people, people with religious excuses were doing foolish things and he was trying to negate those foolish things, um, and, and I may even agree with what he's addressing, the problem that he's addressing. Uh, by the way, one time I saw a bumper sticker that said, doesn't God prefer spiritual fruits to religious nuts? I think that's true. Um, but even if he's speaking to negate certain attitudes that people have of misplaced faith or a misappropriation of faith, so-called faith, um, and he and he said what he said, you can't utter those words. You know I'm saying? You can't utter those words. You can never say the words, God didn't do this. Um, but, it, but that's first of all. But second of all, if you want to know what my stance has been, um, so I just wanted to check to make sure that I... I recalled correctly, but my Parsha Shir from Parsha Svayakil, which was published on March 18th, so back March 18th, and I clearly stated in the Shir that whatever the medical experts are telling us and that Abunim therefore are poskining according to the medical best uh, uh, advice of the medical uh, profession, that that is not only Bidiyevid, after the fact, a leniency, no, that itself is the Chumrah. You want to be from, you want to be Machmir, then be Machmir, be from about following whatever it is that the doctors told us to do. So that, that, that my, and my, my, my stance on that was very, very clear. Um, and now I'm going to get flack <laughs> tonight and tomorrow for the people who are against that. Okay, so be it, at any rate. Uh, so that, that's that. And, 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 and I also want to clarify something. We spoke about it in yesterday's shir. That hishtadlus bedera chatava is not a stira to bitochin whatsoever. Remember, we spoke about the idea that uh, Rebbeinu Bachai himself says in shara bitochin that you have to take normal, responsible, uh, natural steps. And then place your place your trust in Hashem. And if you remember, we mentioned the, what the Alter Rebbe says in Lukut Teitera, where he explains there about the formula. See, so, yeah, on one hand, it's V'racho Hashem aleikecha b'chol Hashem Hashem will bless you in everything you do. You have to do. You can't just sit there, right? 
like the, 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 the joke everybody knows about the guy who prayed, Hashem, make me rich. And Hashem says, fine, I'm going to make you win the lottery. And then the next day, they draw the lottery, and he, he says, Hashem, I, I thought I won the lottery, but I, I didn't win the lottery. And Hashem says, did you buy a ticket? Right? Did you buy a ticket? So there has to be a shtadlis. Bechol tase in everything you do. So you have to do, and the doing is the vessel with, with which we uh, hold on to the blessing. But at the same time, like the Alter Rebbe says, that it's yegiyah kapecha. It is only the toil of your external capacities, and that you save your mind and your heart for Hashem. So it may seem like a contradiction. It's not a contradiction whatsoever. What do we do? We do what you're supposed to do. Okay, if it comes to health, you do what the doctor tells you to do. If it comes to making a living, you have to have a job. You have to go to work. You have to have some type of a business, some natural way that a responsible person would deal with these things. Okay, and all of that is absolutely no contradiction whatsoever that when we go through those motions, we do those things, and we're scrupulous about doing those things, that that's not where we put our emotional um, focus whatsoever. Our mental focus and our emotional focus, that's not where it is. That's not where our security comes from. Our security comes from the fact we know Hashem is doing it all. So even when we followed everything that we're supposed to do naturally and in, in the manner of hishtadlus, and what we called last night making a kli, making a vessel in, in nature, um, and, 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 and we do, and we do, and we, are make, we were very careful to make sure that everything should be done in a natural way. Um, but even after we do all of that, we understand that that's not what brings about our success. Remember, you can do everything that you're supposed to do, and a mensch tracht und Gott lacht, and uh, things don't turn out the way that they're supposed to, okay? So when things turn out in a way that is favorable to us, we should be grateful. Even when we did the, the right things that we were supposed to do um, in a natural way, okay? And that's not a contradiction at all. I also got questions, moving on, I also got questions about what we spoke about uh, yesterday, that there's a sicha in Lakuti Sicha's Chelag Yud Ches, Parshas Kairach, where the Rebbe explains um, that it's not a contradiction with the Meira Nevuchim, what the Rambam says in Meira Nevuchim about Hashkocha Klolis, general supervision, and what uh, the Baal Shem Tov says about Hashkocha Pratis. And uh, without rehashing all of that, because uh, if you want to see it, it's on uh, the recording from yesterday's shir. But uh, we had a few questions about that again. First of all, one question was, uh, where do I find the sicha? Uh, there's, there's five sichas from Parshas Kairach in Chayel Yud Chesav Lekut Sichas. That's true. It's the second sicha in uh, Parshas Kairach. It's pages 196 through 201. It's five pages. It's a short sicha, uh, very deep, very rich, but it's, it's not that long. Um, but one of the questions that was asked about that is, what we explained is when a person... Um, this was based on what we read in uh, Lesson 1, in our first class, where Rabbi Nebuchadnezzar says that when somebody puts his betochen in something other than Hashem, then what happens? Effectively, he creates that reality for himself. It, it says that Hashem is meser hashkachose me'olov. Hashem removes his hashkacha from that person, and he puts that person into the uh, hashkacha of the thing that he's trusting in. So we explained it doesn't mean that actually that that thing that you are that you are that you think uh, you're dependent upon that that thing is actually running your life. I mean that's impossible. Think about it. it doesn't even make sense. It doesn't mean that that thing is actually running your life. What it means is it's going to feel like that thing is running your life. However, obviously, theologically, that would be an impossibility. That other thing is not really running his life. It will just seem that way. Now, somebody asked a question that if that is so, we mentioned that, that this is the idea of the Hester upon him, that Hashem is, is concealing himself. So if that's so, is this not a vicious cycle? The person who sees that other powers in the world are worthy of his trust and he doesn't see Hashem as being worthy of his trust. So he's going to make that shift. And he's going to start seeing things that way. And then it's, you know, it's like a search engine bubble. That the things that you go and Google for, that's what Google tells you more and more about. 
They say now that's why everybody's polit political opinions are so extreme because the search engines, they learn what you're looking for and they just, it's called the echo chamber. It just gives you more and more of the same stuff that you're looking for. So a person who's seeing that the world is random, cruel fate, that's what he's getting more and more of. How do you ever break that? So that was a question that came in. And, and it's a wonderful question. The answer to that is that this is precisely why we need to understand that this is hester upon him. This is a concealment. That it's only bechitzonius. Externally it appears that this other thing or things are running his life. But bepnimius, Hashem is the one who's still running his life. And what that means is that underlying it all, there still is that unbreakable bond and that, call it subconscious or unconscious connection, where deep down, even when a person's mind is telling him that random cruel fate runs the world, uh, deep down in his heart, he knows that it's really Hashem. And that was never removed from him. And he can not only get back in touch with that, but he, he had it all along. That's, that's his deepest connection is to that reality. I was thinking also when uh, preparing for this class about this idea, you know, we see what we're looking for. There's uh, a song which I heard years ago at Fabrengens of Chassidim. When Chassidim get together in the Fabreng, there's a song that usually you don't hear until three or four in the morning. And uh, it's a song that was written by a chassid, a Chabad chassid from Russia, Reb Ben Cheshemtev, Reb Ben Tzien Shemtev. So he wrote this nigun. And actually, I didn't realize, I found out just yesterday, that he collaborated with Yom Tov Erlich. Yom Tov Erlich <clears throat> was in Samarkand, which is a place where a lot of Jews fled uh, from communism and they fled from the war. And it was sort of like a, an oasis of Yiddishkeit in the Soviet Union during, uh, during a certain era, during the war, the post-war. And anyway, so Yom Tverlech collaborated with uh, Rebben Sheshemtov. And there's this song. I mean, it's, I think it's 20 verses long. It's a long song. But the refrain every, after each paragraph is this, Nisim, Nisim, Nisim hot geshen. Veres vil can visin, veres vil can zen. So miracles, miracles, miracles happened. He who wants to can, can know, can visin. He who wants to can zen, can see. So it's all dependent upon what you're looking for. One person would have the same experience and say, it was terrible, we were in communist Russia, and uh, we were, you know, who was in control? The communists were in control, and where was Hashem? And the other person could have the exact same experience, and not only not see it that way, but he would see it as constant miracles. Nisim, nisim, nisim hot kishet. Okay, um, I also want to share with you, um, I mentioned earlier a Parsha share that I gave uh, a few months ago. So I'll mention also, I'll be self -re self referential, and I'll mention a Parsha share that I gave a few weeks ago. I think uh, right after Pesach. So I spoke about Mashiach, Achrin Shal Pesach, and Mashiach Suda. So uh, Parsha right after that, I spoke about, uh, about Mashiach, and I was speaking about, well, it doesn't matter the whole connection, but the point is, I was saying, Mashiach isn't something you get excited about because of a particular reason. Mashiach is always a, a constant reality and a possibility every, every second. That, that was the connection. And I said, you know, it's like Hashgacha Pratis stories. I said, usually I don't like Hashgacha Pratis stories. Why? Because why do people tell them? And what are they trying to convey? They're trying to say, oh, look, Hashem got involved. What do you mean he got involved? It's as if you're saying there's this you know, regular way the, the world runs. Oh, but this one exception, it was really wild. This guy, he had a ticket to go fly, and then he, he, he got a flat tire, and he missed the flight, and the plane blew up. Oh, and he, okay. You know, they're nice stories for speakers to tell because they're dramatic, and everyone gets excited. But the implication of the, a lot of the Hashkacha, well, of the whole genre of Hashkacha Prata stories is really, it's not, a, it's not a very good implication. The implication is, oh, this thing was Hashkacha Pratis, but normally, normally it's not. So my brother, David, who 
I'll also refer to another project of mine. We have a, a video podcast, David and I having discussions, we started a few weeks ago, called uh, Two Brothers Discussing Interesting Subjects or something like that. Anyways, so he was telling me that his daughter in school, his young daughter, uh, she had an, uh, an assignment to come to class with a Hashgacha Pratis story. So, uh, so he told her that she should go to class and, and say, this morning, I got up, and on my way to school, I saw a red car. And that's it. And that, that should be her Shkacha Prata story. And <laughs> my niece says to my brother, I can't do that. That, that, that. My teacher won't like that. He says, well, she should like that. How is that not a Shkacha Prata story? So if you see a red car, that's not Ashgacha Pratis? No, but nothing dramatic happened. Ah, but that's precisely the point. Why does it have to be that something formulaic, that something dramatic happened in order for it to be Hashem running the world? Hashem is always running the world. Okay. Um, fine. So those are some of the issues that came up. And uh, let's go further in the text. Let's try to cover a little bit of ground. So we just finished discussing a person who has trust in himself because of his wealth or because of his strength or because of his wisdom. Now we're going to talk about people putting their trust in other people. Um, and there's a, there's a term for this. There's a 2020 term for making somebody a God substitute in your life. Turning to another human being and asking them to fill the role in your life that really only your creator can fill. And uh, the term is called being a codependent. Because what's a codependent? A codependent is really somebody who wants to get that need for security and safety that need for the world to be a safe place and a place that makes sense. They want to get that need met through other people. And therefore, what happens? We become desperate <clears throat> to get other people to give us this. We think they have it. They, they, we think they hold our serenity, and therefore, we've got to get it from them. And so either we manipulate, usually manipulate, you know, or... Uh, where we strong arm them, we, we demand it from them, or we plead or we beg. And all these ways we try to get something from human beings that they don't really have for us. Um, you know, we call it people pleasing. What's people pleasing? Why are people people pleasers? If you don't like being a people, stop, so stop being a people pleaser. Why, why can't we stop? Because a codependent is an addict. They're addicted to the addict. What does it mean? It means I can't stop people pleasing. If I stop people pleasing, what's going to happen to me? You see, my security, my success, my uh, my safety is in the hands of another human being. So, you know, if I if I don't make sure that that person likes me, then uh, I'm, my my life is over. So when we put our trust in other people, and when we literally idolize them by expecting them to do what only Hashem can do. So what we do is we put ourselves and our emotional well-being completely in their hands. Let, let's look at what Rabbeinu Bechayah says. Mayhem among the advantages of Bitochim. Shahabaytayach velakim yivyano, that one who believes in Hashem brings these advantages. Haftochose olav shleyavet zulose. The one who trusts in Hashem will not submit to another. He will not subjugate himself, make himself an evid, a slave to another. See, trust in Hashem is freedom. Trust in Hashem is freedom. Freedom from having to subjugate myself to people, places, and things. And primarily here, it's, we're talking about to, to people, to relationships. He won't put his hopes in people. And he won't put his trust in human beings. Why does that sound so cynical? He won't hope in people. He won't trust in people. It's not cynical at all. We're meant to love people. <laughs> love them. Don't trust in them. 
We say it every day in davening. Don't trust in the generous people. How much more so the non-generous people, right? Even the generous people. Don't put your hopes in them. Listen, I can love people a whole lot better when I don't put my hopes in them. Or another way of saying it is, I heard it put this way, it was really good. Expectations are premeditated resentments. <laughs> you want to have a resentment against somebody? So decide how they are supposed to behave, and then, you know, get disappointed in them when they don't do it. Especially when you've put your emotional well-being um, on the line, and that, you know, if they don't treat you the way you want to be treated, you know, then, then, then you've already agreed with yourself that you're going to be miserable. So then, of course, you're going to get a resentment. You're not going to be subservient to them in order to win their favor, in order to curry favor, to appease them, to get them to like you. The exhausting job of image maintenance, right? Making sure that people think of me what I need them to think of me because my welfare and my success is all dependent on them giving me what I need, right? That, 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 that idolatry that just exhausts us because we create these idols for ourselves. And you're not, you don't have to flatter them. Oh, what freedom that is that you could actually have a conversation with somebody and just be honest. By the way, it doesn't mean to be a jerk. It doesn't mean to be blunt or, 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 or brash. But see, see there's, that, that's the beauty of it. When you're being nice to someone, it's because you're, you're really being nice to them. See, flattery is, I'm not really being nice to you. I'm using you. I just can't admit it. So, you know, I'm you know, trying, to, trying to butter you up. But when I don't need anything from you, because my father's taking care of me, now I can be nice to you just because it's the right thing to do. Just because you're one of God's kids. So <laughs> now I don't have to flatter. I don't have to flatter you. I can compliment you and it'll be a real compliment and I don't have to flatter. No more flattery, by the way. Do you know what the highest form of flattery is? A plateau. Think about it. The highest form of flattery is a plateau. Okay, it's a geography joke, and you can think about that. Okay. And you will not agree with them anything that is not for the service of Hashem. In other words, oh, we don't become so weak and so dependent on other human beings that we end up doing what? The ultimate form of self-betrayal. The ultimate self-betrayal is we compromise our principles and our values out of fear that we'll lose people. But if we don't need people, if we know we have Hashem, now we'll never do that. We're not going to go along with something. Uh, we're not going to go along with something and compromise our, our, our values and our principles just because we're, we're, we're living in fear of losing a relationship. And again, it's not that we don't care about people. Now we can really first begin to care about people. We're going to have genuine relationships. And their matters, meaning whatever they've got going on, won't, won't, won't frighten us anymore. And we won't be afraid of their disputes. We won't be afraid of, oh, maybe they'll disagree with me. Yeah, maybe they'll disagree with me. That's okay. Avil, rather, what will happen when we no longer put our betochen in other human beings? Yispashit, it's very poetic here. Mispashit mibigde teivasam. We take off the clothing. He calls it like removing this excess clothing of, of relying on favors. And the burden of having to show gratitude, the chavis tagmulam, and repaying them for their good. Now, I just want to make sure it's very clear what this means. It doesn't mean that we become ingrates and that we're no longer appreciative, we no longer say thank you. No, it means quite the opposite. We can finally really say thank you. Because while we were depending on them, we weren't saying thank you because we were really appreciative. We were saying thank you because we were afraid. It's barter. It's emotional barter. It's, we're, we're trading flattery, compliments. You know, it's all emotional ma manipulation. It's not genuine because we're afraid that we're going to lose their, 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 their good favor and their good graces. But when we're no longer living subservient to them, now you can say thank you. You can really mean it. He continues. And let's say you have to critique them. Let's say you have to criticize them. Okay? It is a mitzvah to, to criticize from time to time. 
loy yezar bechveidam. That itself needs to be discussed, I think. We won't worry about their honor. Ve'im yachlimeim le'yevesh mehem. And if he humiliates them, he will not be timid before them. Vle'yapalehem asheker. And he won't beautify falsehoods, you know, tell them a pretty story. What does it mean here? It doesn't mean to become um, vindictive, you know, somebody who enjoys critiquing or enjoys uh, criticizing. That's not what it means. It means that when there's a case where you do have to tell somebody an unpleasant truth, you're actually able to be real about it. And uh, not having to, to sugarcoat that because of... Uh, because of our fear of, 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 of human beings. Kamesha Amar Anavi, like the prophet says, Vashem Alekim Yazerli, Hashem will help me, Al Kain Loi Nichlamti, I therefore I will not be embarrassed, Al Kain Samti Fonai Kechalomash, that I've made my face like a flintstone, that means tough, not like Fred Flintstone. And I know I will not be ashamed. And it also says, Do not be afraid of them, of people, and of their words. Don't be afraid. It says, Don't be afraid of their words. Don't be, uh, don't be frightened before them. And it says, Don't be afraid in front of them. It sounds repetitive, but how many times it says over and over and over again in Torah, Don't be afraid of people. Don't be afraid of them. Don't be afraid of them. I made your forehead strong like uh, the, the Shamir worm. It just means I, I gave you some confidence. I gave you a backbone, some principles. Don't be afraid of them. Don't be frightened by them. Don't be intimidated. So what are we saying here? We're saying that finally, with bitochen, you can have integrity in your relationships. This doesn't mean that we don't care about people anymore. To the contrary, now we finally can care about them. We weren't caring about them before we were using them. It was codependent. It was sick because we thought that our happiness is dependent on them. And it's not. It's only dependent on Hashem. He's taking care of us. And once we accepted that reality, now we can finally relate to them from a genuine place where we're aligned with our values and with, with, with our truth. And, and now real genuine bonding uh, can, can finally occur. Okay, that's... Uh, where we're going to leave off tonight. We thank everybody for joining us, and Yemyatsa Hashem, we will see you tomorrow night. Thank you.